thank you very much everyone for joining at whatever time it might be in your part of the world. Um, we are super excited to be holding this legal um, mastermind as part of our global um, international chapter extravaganza. We've um, been working with Nadia and Co for a while and just so pleased to see this come come to a kind of re re realisation now. Um, we all know that um, starting your own business is super exciting and for early stage entrepreneurs, um, I think what's very clear is it's um, it takes a a little while. Um, it'll be a matter of soaking up all kinds of business advice um, like a sponge. And startup legal advice is one of the most crucial parts um, of that process. I would say that the majority of questions that come our way into the Generate Inbox each week are some way linked to um, legal implications of, of building a business and scaling it. Um, and it may seem more important to create that detailed business plan or find collaborators, but all of that, as we know, goes down the drain if you tangle yourself up in, in legal issues. Um, it's not nuclear physics, but it's not as simple as it looks. And the bottom line is that you should be able to get familiar with some of that basic legal advice for, for startups. And so to help you with the matter, um, we're delighted that we have a, a whole panel and um, a plethora of legal experts um, to really share their best startup um, legal advice um, for all of you guys that are considering starting up a business um, in the States or already based out of um, there. Um, we know that entrepreneurs that face um, the, the biggest challenges are usually the ones that overlook those legal sides of running a business. And um, so really great um, to the guys in the room and girls in the room that are going to be contributing to today's um, talk. I am going to open up questions at the end. Um, if you do have any questions as you go along, please do put them in the chat um, or wait until the end and we can just fire off those questions. And it might be that one or two or all of the speakers um, can contribute to, um, to those queries, um, although each of the speakers have a slightly different angle um, on this. So I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Jonathan. Um, from Fold 11. I hope I've pronounced that right. If not, please do please do correct me. I'm going to be speaking a little bit around corporate entities and for socially impactful businesses and beyond. Um, so Jonathan, over to you. Uh, thanks, LJ. Um, and I know I have 15 minutes and I'll try to make the, the most of it. Um, as LJ mentioned, uh, my name is Jonathan Saban. I'm a corporate attorney at Folger Levin. It's a full service law firm based out of San Francisco and I'm the chair of our corporate department. And as LJ mentioned, the, the topic I'm gonna to cover today is legal entities for a socially impactful business. And so I'm gonna start sharing my screen if I'm able to do that. Um, Looks so, so far so good. All right, so let's jump into it. Oh, there we go. First, some disclaimers. Um, uh, it is required by our ethical rules. This presentation is for informational purposes only. Does not constitute legal tax advice. Is not intended to create. Does not create attorney-client relationship. And anyone viewing the presentation should not act upon the information without seeking professional counsel. I'm sure, the other attorneys on this uh, panel. And they have their own disclaimers or they're welcome to refer to this but to apply to them as well. You know, I should also say that I'm, I'm a California attorney. Um, I know we have a global audience here, so I might get into some kind of uh, so, uh, kind of underlying stuff that I'm not going to assume a lot of knowledge about kind of how attorneys are regulated in the United States. Attorneys are licensed by state, so I'm licensed to practice law in, in California. Can also uh, work in Delaware, and I'll get into Delaware in a, in a, during this presentation. But this presentation is going to generally focus on entities that are available under California law. All right, I'm going to jump into it. <clears throat> Key takeaways: I'm going to start with a spoiler. There's no one entity that's going to work for every purpose. It's not going to be. I can't give you the, the answer right now as to what is the best entity for you. Yeah. And that's because there's many different forms of entities that you can use to form and run a socially impactful business. It's gonna depend on your goals and objectives and the business itself. But my view is, and I think many practitioners views are, is that the, the standard most commonly used forms of entities in the United States will, and which I'll go on today, will work to form and run a socially impactful business. The ultimate goal in choosing an entity is to set yourself up for success. You want to have 
the right platform at the beginning to operate and grow in an efficient manner and in a way that you want. And I have seen instances where the wrong entity choice was um, chosen and it can create complications down the road. And with, with, with that in mind, because we have a global audience today, um, what I'd like to do with this presentation is to give a high level overview of some of the different types of entities that are available, mainly in California, but also in the United States and some related matters. So there's three takeaways I'd like you to have from this presentation. Number one, I'd like you to have a sense of the entities that are commonly used. Number two, I'd like you to be familiar with some of the major issues to consider when selecting an entity. And number three is when you're ready to form an entity that you go talk with an attorney. There are many online services out there that will help you form an entity or you know, legal Zoom and other online places that will do it. You, an attorney can do that as well. But the value of talking with an attorney, it's not the mechanical filing. It's about that they can help you analyze and think through which entity choice is the right for you, right one for you. And that might be a five minute conversation. It might be more in depth, but it, it, it should be, you know, talk with an attorney when you're ready. All right. And let's get on to um, the potential entity structures. The two most common uh, entity structures, in the United States, and that probably is going to work for a socially impactful business, uh, for at least a for profit making one is a corporation or a limited liability company. A corporation is gonna end with a corp or an inc or an incorporated, those all are designations of a corporation. A limited liability company ends with an LLC or with periods in between the letters. Um, I'm gonna go into more detail about these, uh, these two entities in a little bit, but I wanted to introduce them here as the you know, most common forms of entities. Um, and I'm going to say a word about C corps and S corps. Some of you might be familiar with corporations and have heard that you know that there's a you know, C corp and an S corp, and you know, what's the difference? The difference is tax. And I'll talk about later. But C corps have two layers of taxation. More tax, they can be more tax inefficient. S corps have one layer of tax. Um, of taxation. Now, S corps are beyond the scope of this presentation, but before you go and start asking about, well, why doesn't everybody use S corps? There's a number of restrictions on S corps that, that makes it not a very attractive vehicle for many ventures. And, and why C corp, why S corp, why those letters? Um, the tax code is divided into chapters and sub chapters, uh, and the taxation is, is sub chapter C. Of the tax code and subchapter S uh, for the S corp. It's the S corp election. So corporate attorneys aren't very, and tax attorneys are very creative. And so they just pick the name from the chapters. So that's the C corp and S corp. Um, there are many other entities that are available. I'm going to talk about just since we're talking about socially impactful businesses, there are two entities in California. Now, every state, every state may not have these, or they may have different flavors of them. In California, we have what's called a benefit corporation and a social purpose corporation. Um, and these are, you know, their purpose is to create a, a general public benefit, be it environmental or health or achieve a social purpose. And those purposes are hardwired into the corporate governance. And I, I wanted to raise them because you might come across them thinking about a socially impactful business and say, these are not widely used entities. I don't see the, these are, you don't see them very much. They're new. They were created the last 10 to 15 years ago. Um, and your know, practitioners tend not to use these for, I think for two reasons. Number one, uh, they're new. And so there's not a lot, a lot of law around how these organizations are supposed to work. And lawyers don't like ambiguity. And, the, and combine that with the fact that the, the most commonly used entity forms, a corporation or LLC, most practitioners think work just fine. So combine the, the ambiguity and the newness 
with an existing structure that's, that is gonna work results in these entities not being widely used. Um, and I'll say something about the B Corporation. You might've heard about a B Corp. So now we have a B Corp and a C Corp and S Corp. A B Corp does not mean benefit corporation. A B Corp is not a legal entity. It is a private certification from a company called B Lab. And that is where for-profit companies that demonstrate a high level of social and environmental performance can get certified by B Labs and call themselves a B Corp. But from a corporate lawyer, uh, a corporate law perspective, it is not an entity, um, it's not a legal entity. So they, you might be a C Corp that then has a B Corp certification. And there's other forms uh, of entities, you know, you, you have nonprofit corporations, which internationally is NGOs. And these are your charities and edu educational institutions that, that might be appropriate. And you have a whole host of others uh, that are going to differ from each other in various ways, from governance to liability protection. You have a professional corporation, limited partnerships, limited liability partnerships, general partnerships, and sole proprietorships. You know, our law firms are limited liability partnerships because law firms can only be certain types of, uh, of entities. But you know, by and large, at the end of the day, I think the two types of entities that you know, you'll probably end up using in a for-profit context are gonna be a corporation and limited liability company. At least those are the two most commonly used. Um, so hopefully that gets you, you have some, to the first takeaway, some sense of the entities that are commonly used. <clears throat> now, considerations to think about when um, selecting an entity. So these, when somebody comes to me and says, you know, Jonathan, you know, I'd like to form an entity. These are what I'm gonna, these are the items that I'm gonna talk to a client about and I'm gonna think about. Number one, do you, do they need, do you need to raise capital? If so, from who? Because that can decide or at least tilt uh, uh, which entity uh, you're going to wanna choose. Taxation. Does tax efficiency matter? You know, one layer of taxation versus having a pass-through tax entity where there's only one layer of taxation. Is the company going to have losses that you're going to want to be able to utilize? What's your exit strategy? Um, you know, folks find it you, you may find it odd. One of the first questions I ask them when they say, "Hey, we're, I'm going to start a business," and I say, "Great, what's your exit?" Right? Because you should have a business plan, and the business plan has may have an exit. And how you want to exit, how you plan to exit could dictate what entity choice you choose at the beginning. Management and control. Are there unique things about how you want to manage and control your organization that could dictate what entity choice you use? How do you want to compensate employees? Are you going to want to use equity? I've seen company, because some forms of entities are easier and more straightforward to issue uh, equity to employees. And I've seen uh, entity choices be based on this factor. Cost and ease of formation. Is that a factor? Some, depending on the complexity of a business, you know, one entity choice might be a lot more time consuming and expensive to form than another. And personal liability, I assume everybody who's starting a business wants to limit their liability to their investment. And so uh, obviously wanna choose a form of limited liability. So these are the considerations that I think about, at least the major ones, in selecting uh, which entity to choose. And I'm going to have a note on how I'm doing on time here. What about five minutes left? Five minutes. All right. Uh, I will. So doing good. Um, where to organize? Uh, entities are state specific, um, and in the United States. And so you have 50 states and you could organize your, your entity in one of those 50 states. So which one to choose? You, you form, you know, generally, you got to form where you're located, where you're doing business. For example, if you're located in California, doing business in California, and your nexus is really California, California is a good, a good choice as to where to form. You can do business in the United States and internationally, but it's, it's this where you're organized is going to uh, govern your the internal laws of uh, in, the internal governance of the organization. Um, another popular jurisdiction is Delaware. Why Delaware? A lot of ink has been uh, spent writing about Delaware as a popular jurisdiction. At the end of the day, it's a, a, a lot of 
entities are formed in Delaware. And I think in large part, it's because they have a very well-developed corporate law. They have very uh, sophisticated courts who understand corporate law. And, and you, for lawyers and business folks, uh, the rules of the road are very clear in Delaware as to the internal governance of organizations. And so that leads to more efficiency, less disputes. And so I think having that sophisticated jurisprudence um, makes that an attractive uh, uh, um, uh, jurisdiction which to organize. And so as a California attorney, I'll organize entities in California and also in Delaware because I end up practicing there, or at least familiar with those laws, um, I should say. Uh, also, it's very user-friendly. Um, the remaining time, I said the two most uh, commonly used forms of entities are going to be a corporation and an LLC. I'd like to go kind of one level deeper and just to just kind of talk about what are some characteristics of each. First, some nomenclature of a corporation. The owners are called shareholders or stockholders, depending on the jurisdiction in which you're formed. The control, a, a corporation is controlled and governed by a board of directors who then elect or appoint officers. And that's your president, treasurer, or CFO, and secretary that handle the day-to-day -day operations of the business. So the shareholders elect the directors, and the directors then elect or appoint hire the officers. Uh, corporations have limited liability to the owners. There are, you know, there are instances where there, it's what's called piercing the corporate veil, which is um, where folks may try to go after the owners uh, to, to pierce the liability protection. But by and large, uh, corporations, and I'll talk about LLCs, uh, are limited liability vehicles. Taxation, and this is the big one for corporations. There's two layers of taxation at the cor for corporations. What do I mean by that? There's a tax at the corporate level and shareholder level. For example, if a corporation makes 100 bucks, it'll be taxed on 100 bucks. Now, then that reduced amount is stuck within the corporation. For it to get out to the shareholders or stockholders, it has to do that by a div what's called a dividend. And once those, those dollars go up to the shareholder, it is taxed again as income to the shareholder. So there's tax at the corporate level and another tax again at the uh, shareholder level. Now, why would you choose to, ha to have that type of structure, which can be tax inefficient, depending on tax rates. Um, in large part, it depends on your investors. If you know, I'm in Silicon Valley, um, and for firms that want VC funding, you'll end up generally, they, for their own tax reasons, they want uh, their, their, uh, their investments to be corporations and also organized in Delaware. Uh, they're investor friendly. Uh, they've been around for a long time and investors know them and the rules about kind of how their investments are governed are very clear. And, and I know I'm running short on time, so I will, I will, uh, I'll hurry up. Giving equity to employees and corporations generally very straightforward. Think about stock options and it's simple and easy to form. And I'll talk briefly about LLCs, limited liability companies. The key thing here, they're very flexible entities. Um, and that's a good thing and bad thing. The good thing is they're very flexible so you can tailor them to exactly how you want. The, the downside is you can tailor them to exactly how you want. So you gotta think about all this stuff up front and it can make things complicated. And I'll put all these out real fast and I'll go through them. The nomenclature, which is the ownership, it's called, they're owned by members and the, the the entity can be controlled as either member managed by the members or it can be a manager member managed entity, which is somebody else manages it. You can have officers. Again, like a corporation is limited liability. Key thing is on the taxation, it's a single layer of tax. It's a pass through tax entity. So if the LLC makes $100 and it's only owned by one member, it's as if the one member made 100 bucks. So there's one layer of tax. Generally, it's investor friendly. Investors know these, you can take on investments, but some investors are not going to like this entity as an investment vehicle. Um, think about VC firms and there are ways to structure them, but it gets quite complicated. And giving equity to employees in an LLC can get complicated. There's ways to do it, uh, but it's not as straightforward and known as a, a stock option. Um, and it can create some ramifications for the employees and their own taxes. Um, ease of formation. 
it's going to depend on the complexity of the the business. If it's not very complicated, it can be uh, quite simple and inexpensive to form. If you have very complicated business structure or kind of governance, it can be quite expensive to form. So I know I am short on time and I'm out of time. So I want to say thank you. And, and I'll leave because um, I think uh, Chenye is next um, with her colleague is one of the things I do talk about with clients, not only it's just important as choosing the right entity is getting the employee and contractor classification correct, because that it, while you can correct a lot of things on the corporate front, you may not be able to correct without uh, running into a lot of headaches, um, how you deal with employees and, and contractors. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was hugely informational. So thanks very much. Um, as you rightly said, um, we're going to go on to the next part of our mastermind, which, mastermind, which is with um, Kenya. And she's going to be I'm, I'm at building the team. So the employee versus the contractors um, and LSE alum, I believe. Is that right? Yes, I am an LSE alum. And this is Trevor, an attorney and a colleague of mine. Yeah, and you guys already know Chinye. Uh, we're attorneys at Roxborough Palmer and Sinai Adriani in the employment practices group. Uh, it's a full service law firm, but we're in the employment practice part. And you can find our profiles, individual profiles on the firm's website. Now for this session, we'll focus on California law. So you've incorporated your business. You need talent, people with skills. Your business is starting and you have finite resources. Do you recruit talent as employees or as independent contractors? What is the difference and why does it matter? If your company has everyone sign an agreement that each person hired is an independent contractor and your company provides each person with a required federal tax document for independent contractors, does this guarantee that the workers will in fact be independent contractors? These are some of the questions that we hope will be, you will be able to answer when you finish, when we finish our session. Both an employee and an independent contractor can have the skills and knowledge that your business needs. So which is best for your business? The answer can ultimately depend on how much resources you have. In California, for example, employees will generally cost a business much, much more than using the services of an independent contractor. To keep costs down, this creates an incentive to classify workers as independent contractors. However, having employees also has its advantages like loyalty and more control. Now, why does the distinction matter? Misclassifying a worker is a very, very serious matter in California, and it could have a terrible impact on your business, not to mention the possibility of going to jail if the consequences of misclassification are also criminal. When you hire an employee, in addition to paying them, you must also provide them with an itemized federal and state tax deductions, that is a pay stub. You, the employer, are responsible for making the tax deductions. You, the employer, are responsible for paying the tax deductions to the appropriate tax agencies. This means that your business will have to pay to hire staff or to retain the services of an agency to prepare each pay stub for each employee every time payments are made, which could be weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. Let's look at the mandatory tax deductions that you, the employer, must make. If you look at the um, screen, you'll see the column on the right, deductions. Go to the column on the left, deductions. Now go to the next column, it says statutory. That provides you with a list of the mandatory deductions, starting with the federal income tax deduction, right down to the California state disability insurance deductions. Those are mandatory. Under that, you have the word other. That category of optional, basically benefits. So by law, they're not mandatory, but as an employer, you provide them to be competitive when recruiting people. So once again, that adds to the business costs. We're gonna now move to another type of um, pay stub. This is for the hourly rate. Again, you see on the right, the box deductions, those are mandated as an employer. And to the left, earnings, you see the hourly, um, the rate they're paid. Now, contrast those two employee pay stubs that the employer has to generate each time an employee is paid with the IRS 1099 form that your business will have to provide for an independent contractor only once a year at the end of the tax year. 
There are no tax deductions here. You simply plug in the total annual amount that you pay the independent contractor using the correct category. Sometimes the only parts you need to complete are the left side for identification purposes and category number three, other, and you are done for the entire year. Let's look at one case to see how the courts have classified certain people as employees versus independent contractors. You will see in the handout on page two, a list of cases. We will select one. This case will give you a flavor of how to conduct your business so that you keep the classification of the worker that you want and thereby avoid the serious consequences of misclassification. Let's take a look at the Borello case, which is the third one listed on the left side of your handout. The facts here um, concern a farmer, essentially a farming corporation, but I'll call it a farmer. The farmer alleged that the laborers were share farmers and as such were not employees because they managed their own labor, shared in the crop's profit or loss and had entered into contracts that stated that they were not employees. Whether the agricultural laborer, laborers were employees or independent contractors mattered because the question was whether they were covered under workers' compensation insurance, which is only available for employees when they are injured. You will see on the handout, page one, we, um, there's a chart of all the benefits and so forth. Now, the Borello court noted that Despite the contract and profit and loss sharing, the court concluded that the laborers were employees, stating that the farmer controlled the agricultural operations on its premises from planting to sale of the crops, and instead of direct supervision, used profit sharing as an incentive to achieve its goals. Therefore, the farmer, it happens to be a corporation, retained all necessary control over the work which could be done only one way. <clears throat> also, the laborer's work, though seasonal, followed the usual pattern of an employee. Quoting the court, quote, in no practical sense are the share farmers entrepreneurs operating independent businesses of their own accounts. End quote. The court concluded that the laborers were employees entitled to be covered under workers' compensation insurance. The Borella court arrived at this decision after looking at multiple factors that pertain to whether or not the employer had the right to control the laborer and how the work was done. The burden of proving that a worker was an independent contractor and not an employee rests with the employer. The factors are complex and multi-layered, but they can be summarized as, can the employer fire the worker? And if doing so, will it um, cause a breach of contract action? Is the work engaged in a distinct occupation or business? The nature of the work and whether it is done by a specialist without supervision or done under the supervision of the employer. Is the work a regular integral part of the employer's business? Who supplies the equipment and tools? Is the worker or the employer? Has the worker invested in the business in any way by buying materials or equipment? How is the worker paid? Is it by time spent or by job completed? Can the worker delegate and hire his or her own employees? Is there an opportunity for the worker to make a profit or loss upon his, based upon his managerial skills? How permanent is the relationship between the worker and employer? For how long is the worker expected to work? Do both the worker and potential employer believe they're creating employee-employee relationships? Those are the factors looked at. By the 21st century, the legal test for de determining whether a worker is an employee or not changed a little. However, in instances where the new test does not apply, the Borello right to control test is used even up until today. Yeah, and so uh, the new test uh, came about in 2018 uh, in that Dynamex versus Superior Court case that's listed at the bottom here. Um, Dynamex moved slightly away from Borello uh, and laid out what's commonly referred to as the ABC test. Um, so the ABC test uh, has since been codified uh, in the California Labor Code, um, and it looks 
pretty basic and it's the general test to determine whether a worker is independent contractor or employee. As we're going through this, keep in mind though that the actual statute's fairly long um, and there are a lot of exceptions that could apply. And when you are looking at this for your own company, you need to be aware of all the exceptions and business to business exceptions and whatnot that could apply. But, but in general, um, the ABC test works where a worker is presumed to be an employee unless the hiring entity can establish A, B, and C. You have to establish each and every prong. Um, it, it incorporates some of the aspects of Borello, like in the first, in the A prong, and in the C prong, but but generally B uh, is the hardest prong to satisfy for most businesses. Um, and B is the person performs work that is outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business. And as you can imagine, usually when you're hiring uh, somebody to work for your company, it's not going to be for work that is outside the usual course of your business. And so the test really does fall in favor of uh, classifying workers as employees um, and, and more often than not. And I, I, I believe that the California legislator uh, purposely took that position and likes to have workers be classified as employees uh, because um, being an employee comes with a lot of benefits and protections from the labor code. Um, even if you satisfy all three of these prongs, you still need to kind of go back to Borello and look at the control factors uh, that Chenier had mentioned to be certain that you're not exerting uh, too much control over an independent contractor. Um, so once you have determined um, that a worker is an employee, they're entitled to uh, a myriad of protections under the labor code. Um, the, the basic ones are minimum wage and overtime, things like that. Um, two of very important ones are meal and rest breaks. Um, and Brinker on the right over here, the Brinker Restaurant Corp case and Augustus uh, both kind of deal with the requirements to uh, to provide meal and rest breaks. Really, Brinker is the case that solidified the obligation of employers to authorize and permit uh, employees to take an unpaid, completely off-duty meal period before the fifth hour of work, uh, a 30-minute meal period. Um, and that is kind of the seminal case that is quoted very often when there are claims uh, for the failure to provide meal periods. Augustus is a case that our firm was heavily involved with. Uh, it took about 10 years to go to the California Supreme Court, um, but it confirmed um, that the 10 minute rest breaks that are required for every four hours worked uh, need to be completely off duty as well. Um, at that point uh, and how ABM had defended themselves, uh, the prevailing belief was that rest periods, because they are paid rest periods, so they're paid 10 minute rest periods, uh, that there could be some modicum of control over the employee um, while they are working uh, or while they're on their break. Um, but Augustus really said, no, it needs to be off duty. Um, and that is the, the rule to this day, generally, is that you need to provide off duty 10 minute paid meal breaks. So um, another uh, aspect of having employees is uh, the obligations and responsibilities that arise for documentation. Um, generally, best practices are to create these records and keep them for at least four years. Um, failure to document certain things, if you look here below at that furry case, um, if Things are not documented like hours worked, meals taken. Uh, it creates a presumption against the employer. And what it does is it really means that if an employee uh, brings a claim against you at some point and you have no documentation, the employee can essentially prove their case by saying they worked so many hours or they never got their breaks. And you as the employer would have to come up with the evidence to rebut that, which is really difficult to overcome at that point. And so if you look up at the top, there's some mandatory wage and hour documentation. Some of the basic ones are like the labor code section 2810.5 notice, which is a California prepared form that gives notice of like wages, uh, the, the hourly rates and overtime rate and whatnot. Uh, time records are very important, like I said. Um, they need to show when the employee begins and ends each work period and generally track meal periods. And as Chenet had gone over 
prior, uh, you need to have itemized wage statements as well. Um, it's recommended that, at least I recommend to all my clients that we have off the clock work policies and meal and rest break policies, just so that the employees cannot claim that they didn't know that uh, they were entitled to certain rights under the labor code. Um, <clears throat> right here. Oh, one last thing I was going to mention is if you grow your business relatively quick, as soon as you get over five employees, and if you get higher than five employees, you need to start looking at the requirements for certain policies and whatnot. Um, because as companies grow in California, you get a lot more obligations put on you. So uh, here I have a sample daily timesheet. If you look at it, it's this pretty basic one that a small company would generally use. Um, it's handwritten, it tracks the start time, the lunch breaks, the end time, the net hours. If there's reimbursable expenses, you have uh, mileage and whatnot. And at the bottom here, this one has a certification that, that the employee took all their breaks and was not injured during that work period. Um, and it's generally a pretty good uh, sample of at least the basic requirements as a company grows, um, or uh, if you have like a payroll provider, you might be able to start tracking this stuff through uh, an app on the phone or some other technological means and instead of writing it down. We have given you a snapshot of the law as it is today. In California and in many other states, the law can change overnight. So one example of that is uh, the Augustus case that I was talking about just recently. After we won that case, um, the security company lobby essentially uh, lobbied in an exemption for security companies for off-duty breaks. Um, the same thing happened with ambulance companies. Uh, they were able to get a proposition passed, which exempted them from having to provide off-duty breaks. So, you know, all aspects of the labor code generally has some sort of exemption or industry-specific rules. You remember the three questions we started with? We hope that you can now answer them for yourselves. The questions were, do you recruit talent as employees or as independent contractors? What is the difference and why does it matter? And then the last question was about whether having a contract will um, prevail over the facts of the relationship. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. That was great. Um, there was one question that just came up around, um, I think it was from Samantha. Samantha, are you there? Do you want to respond to that if you haven't had that answered yet? Yeah. Yeah. So AB5 is uh, what codified the ABC test. Uh, I am not generally a fan of it. It kind of was an upheaval <laughs> when it came out. I like the control test better. The ABC test is really difficult um, to, to satisfy for independent contractors, and it leaves a lot of open questions. I also dislike the piecemeal way that it came about. I mean, if you look at it, uh, they came out with like a general uh, employment test for the ABC test realized that it essentially classified everyone as an employee, even traditionally independent contractor type uh, workers. Um, and then so instead of kind of revising the test, what they did is just add massive amounts of exceptions for different industries. Um, and I just think it, it, to me, it's not the best way. I think it was a good idea that kind of backfired. Um, and now it's just something we got to deal with. I tend to agree with Trevor on that. And the problem is, is that B that he mentioned, um, the B test, that is the trigger for the multiple exceptions that have been created, which means that even if you know the law, you now have to look up a list of so many exceptions and so forth. So that's a big problem for that um, aspect of the law. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, and we will be around to answer any more questions that arise when you're just trying to digest that information um, in a little bit. Um, Nadia, over to you. Great. Thank you. So my name is Nadia Yakub, and I'm an immigration attorney. I've been practicing for over 20 years. Um, I did my master's at the LSC in international relations. Um, I sort of did law degree and the master's. And um, and it's, you know, it, it's, uh, I would say my master's has informed my choice of work in immigration because it's very international. I get to work with international folks all day long. Um, and I really, really find that satisfying. So now I'm going to jump into my presentation because um, I would love to 
you know, give you guys some ideas on visa options for starting or taking your companies to the United States. So let me do the share screen and then let me make sure it's in um, slideshow. Okay, so let's do here. Okay, so this is what I'll be covering really quickly today. I'll just talk very quickly about visiting the United States for business um, because that may be all you need to do to grow your company into the United States or oversee it. I'll also talk about working as an international student. Perhaps there's value in studying here um, while growing a network and the work authorization you could get to start a company here or grow a business. I'll go over the most common temporary employment-based visas um, and which ones are ideally suited for starting a business. Um, and then I'll talk about the International Entrepreneur Parole Program, um, which is really in its infancy. And is there's not a lot of visibility on how these are being um, implemented. It's quite new, um, but I'll also talk about that. And then we can open it up to questions and answers. Okay, so just really quickly again, you know, for a lot of you who are thinking about starting a business in the United States, you can come and do your due diligence on uh, the visitor visa. It's B1, that's the business visa that you would apply for at the US consulate, uh, unless you are from a visa waived country, that means you participate in ESTA. So if you are coming on the ESTA, it's for 90 days. If you're coming on the B1, you have six months, which can be you know, more spacious in terms of time for doing your due diligence, finding you know, where you want to um, incorporate, meeting with accountants, lawyers, getting an office, all of these um, factors that go into setting up a company. Most of my clients do it on the visitor visa or their students here already in the United States. Um, the one drawback on the ESTA is that when you come in for 90 days, you cannot extend. So you have to leave North America. You can't go to Canada or Mexico and then just jump back into the US to get another 90 days. You have to leave North America. So back to Europe, South America, and then you can come in to get that full 90 days. So again, just in terms of, for some of my clients, three months is not enough. If that's the case to do the due diligence, to set things up, to look at things, um, then you might want to get the B-1 visa. Um, those of you who are nationals of countries that require a visa to enter the U.S., you'd need to get this anyway. Um, and again, this is also a visa you could use if, let's say, you've got the operations running in the U.S., but you don't want to relocate here. You can be coming as a visitor to oversee your business, okay? Um, another way to think about starting a business in the United States is studying here. Um, you know, this way you get a degree or a certificate um, and you build a network, you're on the ground um, and you would get work authorization. Um, generally what happens is at the end of your studies of, of a degree, so it's not like studying English or a summer course, it has to be an academic year. At the end of an academic year, um, or if let's say at the end of your degree program, um, you could get one year of work authorization. And it's called OPT and it's very flexible. You can found a company, you can volunteer, you can uh, work um, you know, as a freelancer. Um, you, you know, it's very flexible. And a lot of my um, clients actually have studied here. They've met a group of people with whom they want to found a company, and then they use their OPT to really take, to, to build that company. Um, now, if you are a graduate of a STEM field, you actually get an extra two more years of work authorization. So you could do a degree that's 18 months, let's say, or an MBA, and more and more MBAs are, um, basically asking the government to be classified as a STEM field because it's very, let's say there's a lot of quant and math in the MBA program, then they're essentially, you're, you'd essentially get three years of work authorization, which could be great for you to take that company off the ground. Okay, so that's the F1 visa that uh, is for international students. Now, in terms of temporary employment-based visas, um, these are visas which would require a sponsor 
in the United States. That sponsor could even be your company that you found, um, but let's, let's talk about what that would look like. So one visa that is great for you to bring your business to the United States is the L1 visa, but this requires that you already have a business in another country. And so what you're doing is you're essentially now creating an international company because you have a, a, um, entities in more than one country. So that's how the US immigration statute defines an international company is that you are operating in two or more countries. Okay, so the L1 visa is great if you are if you already have a business or organization in the United States and you want to expand to I'm sorry, if you already have one outside. So let's say you're in the UK and you already have your entity and you now want to set up an affiliate or subsidiary in the US, you could do that after you've worked for at least one year abroad. Um, you would also need to come to work in a particular capacity. So either as a manager, executive, or a worker with specialized knowledge. Um, you can use the L to open the new office, okay? So let's say you've got your entity in the UK, you're setting up the office in the US, you can get the L1 visa to set it up. It's called a new office L. Okay, so this is a great visa. Again, if you've already got an entity in the, U, you know, anywhere in the world, want to bring it to the US, the L1 visa is great. The one, again, remember, you need to have been working overseas for that company for one year. Um, now, you also need to maintain that overseas operation when you come to the US to either start or grow the business. Okay, so that's the L visa. I'm going to quickly give you some just nuts and bolts. Oh, sorry, hold on. It's for some reason it's not moving forward. Just a second. Oh, there we go. Um, so just filing details in terms of you know budgeting for these visa options. It's about a thousand dollars to get the government filing fees paid. If you want a decision in under 15 calendar days, it's $2,500 extra. It's called premium processing. In terms of timeline and planning, if you're coming in as a specialized knowledge, then it, you should be playing an active and central role in the operations of the business. So you can't just be an investor and you have to show proof of funding. And the amounts are for investment, you have to show 250,000. And if you're, you know, startup working with government, it's 100,000. And the last thing I want to say about the invest, in investment by investors, um, it can't be friends or family. So your investor can't be a relative. There's actually very specific requirements for who qualifies as an investor. Um, this is just a slide on the filing procedure, but the key thing to keep in mind is that there's a five-year maximum to the international entrepreneur parole status. A lot of what a lot of us lawyers say is, okay, you know, we would move them over to the O uh, to get them more time. We would get them green cards based on extraordinary ability. There are workarounds for this five-year limit. So if you want to stay longer than five years, there are backup options. And I just want to close by saying I do have a podcast series um, on the different visa categories. So if there's one that speaks to you, you can just look on my website. Um, they're pretty small. I have some interviews with folks. I, I just my most recent one was with someone who got a green card based on extraordinary ability, his journey from student 01 and then the green card. Um, so you can check those out. And then I'd love it if you could stay in touch. This is my team and we're all here to help you as needed. All right, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nadia. That's absolutely brilliant. I'm gonna pass very quickly to Laura for the final part on IP and then the questions will commence. Yes, and I am just trying to uh, share my screen really quick. Get into the... Presentation mode. 
In the meantime, while I figure out presentation mode, um, I'm Laura Schlesinger. I have um, primarily focused in my practice on um, intellectual property and advertising law. So that is what I'm talking about today. I'm gonna to teach you all of intellectual property in hopefully the next 15 minutes and I don't. All right, so I wanna start off by just saying that you know, I'm, I'm, you guys can't possibly learn everything that you need to know. Obviously you've seen, you've gotten a lot of information in the last um, hour or so. I really just want you to be able to issue spot so that then you can go and, and take timely action on these various areas. And there's, you know, every business is different. Some of these may or may not be relevant to you, but just so that you can be on the lookout and then know kind of some of the major pitfalls that I see commonly in um, a lot of the early stage companies that I've worked with. So we're gonna start off with patents, which is of course, one of the biggest topics that uh, entrepreneurs ask me about in the Silicon Valley area. Um, obviously, most of it's tech. Um, I, I used a lot of different examples here because technology, you know, especially software patents are not, um, as easy uh, illustratively, um, but there's many different types of patents. And the idea is that they have to be useful inventions, okay? So they have to be novel, non-obvious and useful. Um, that means that it can't be, for example, um, just a simple improvement on an existing um, investment in invention, if it's, if that would be maybe like the logical progression of that invention. So the, the threshold there is that it has to be novel and non-obvious. One of the important things, and I, there's also design patents, which, um, those have to be novel, non-obvious and ornamental, it's probably a little less common, but I have a lot of clients that are in more like fashion and, and those areas. Um, the, the patents, once you have one issued, the standard utility patent lasts for 20 years. So particularly, you know, if you talk about this, the pharmaceutical industry, this is just a game changer. Nobody else can um, sell that invention without your licensing it to them for 20 years if you get a patent. So, I mean, you get that, um, you know, talk about cornering the market, right? Um, so that's why patents can be super uh, valuable for companies. You have a, a patent on something and nobody else can touch it. So the, the drug manufacturers, of course, are like the big ones these days that we, we talk about, you know, um, if you get a patent on, for example, there's some disputes right now over some of the COVID vaccine patents and, um, you know, some international negotiations that have gone on in the last couple of years about um, getting, um, you know, generic drugs, for example, to areas of the world where they might not be able to afford the patented versions and all sorts of stuff. But overall, um, for, and that can be, you know, get into some moral issues there, but for most of our clients, you know, it is important if you have an invention that's patentable, you really want to address it um, in a timely manner because time comes, time's really important for patents. Business method patents, I don't have time to go into, but there are, um, you know, business method patents, which it's a high bar to achieve. So useful, concrete and tangible result. Um, so here's a couple of famous examples. Um, the like one click, these are, these are a little outdated, but they're some of the most famous ones. The, the one click shopping um, purchase, you have to be able to um, show that like the, the technology really results in something, uh, in a tangible result. Um, one of the, the things that I need to, yeah, as I referred to with the timing that I need to flag is that once you start um, disclosing the patent publicly, there's a time clock that begins running. And if you let that run out, you're, you're basically going to not be able to file the patent um, or get patent protection. So once it's disclosed to the public and um, that can look like different things, but usually a, 
the confidential discussion with venture capitalists is not going to be a public disclosure. But if you go to, say, a, um, a tech conference and you demo your product, um, a beta version of your product or something like that, that would absolutely be public disclosure. So what I recommend is that you talk to a patent attorney early on before you begin um, uh, any type of a roadshow whatsoever. Um, these take a long time to, to file as well. They can be very complicated. So I would get on that right away. Um, the other thing is if for the people that are working full time while starting a side, you know, starting your business on the side or something like that, um, if you're working on any technology, any inventions that are related to your employer's scope of business, um, you're kind of in a danger zone because most companies will have clauses that, and just because of the way the law works, that assumes that the default ownership is the employer if their employee is creating it. So you really want to make sure if you are doing that side hustle that you're not doing it on company time. You know, it's always after, after hours, you're using your personal computer. You don't ever use um, com your company issued computer. And really, you know, if it is something that, as I said, is like a competitive product or would be potentially in the product roadmap of your company, like there's a good chance that they're going to have rights to it. So that's something that you're going to want to probably disclose to them, have a conversation about, um, just be careful about that. So trademarks nowadays with social media, I think that the whole, you know, idea of brand is, very much in the um you know the forefront of public consciousness like everybody is aware of people building their brands and influencers building their brands and one of the the cores of a commercial brand you know for a, for a corporate entity is going to be the trademarks so these are all um trademarks i, I noticed that there's no company names on here but you probably know the company from each of these uh, images or taglines. You know, you see the the Coke bottle, um, the Burberry fabric umbrella, the Apple um, Apple <laughs> logo, uh, the Android logo, Yahoo. Um, the shoes are by Louboutin. So anyway, all of these are very famous marks, and just by seeing that logo or tagline, we immediately in our mind make that association with with the company. So that's a really strong, that's strong branding right there, right? That's one of the first things that you want to establish when you're, um, you're doing that marketing component, where you're moving into the marketing of your, of your product. Um, you can get a trademark in a logo, you can get a trademark in a name. Um, obviously, you know, names of companies are, are generally trademarked names of products and some more obscure trademarks are patterns, colors, and shapes. So anything can be trademarked and I don't have time to go into these. Anything can be trademarked as long as it is essentially an indicia of that identity of the brand. So if you see it or hear it in some cases, um, you know, you can think of like the Intel bong, bong, bong sound, um, the MGM lion, there's some sounds that are trademarked. And as soon as you experience that, whatever that is, you think of the company or you're aware that it is associated with the company. So at the, at the core trademarks protect consumers because they know where their products are coming from. So you might be one of those people that buys generic Coca-Cola, but there are some people that would never drink generic Coca-Cola, you know, like the cola brand from, a grocery store. They're going to, they want to drink the Pepsi. They want to drink the cola, you know, the Coca-Cola. Um, to a lot of people, it really matters. You know, that if you buy Nike shoes, you get a certain quality level. Um, you know, if you buy Gucci, you're getting a certain quality level. So um, at the heart from the government's perspective, it's a um, consumer protection issue, but for for companies, of course, it's just, I mean, it's marketing and building that brand is super powerful in the mind of the consumer. So copyright, these days, most of what I see with the average, um, you know, startup for copyright, this is going to come in during your advertising. So a lot of the rest of this presentation, we'll talk about 
um, advertising. And nowadays, of course, social media is where a lot of people are advertising. Um, but copyright covers anything that's a creative work. So it can be a photograph, it can be a painting, it can be a, um, a novel and, um, you know, songs and even some, um, because they are essentially written works, some software can be copyrighted. The, the uh, protection you get in it is very different than you get from a software patent. So it, it protects the creative elements, the elements of expression, and not so much the utility of it, right? Um, newspaper articles as well. Um, infringement is, is going to be based on substantial similarity. So it doesn't have to be exact to be infringing. So a lot of the stuff that you see in social media these days is, is technically a copyright infringement. Now, if it's done by a, you know, a person, memes, for example, like all memes are pretty much in most cases, copyright infringement. Um, you, you know, if, if I make uh, a meme and I post it on my personal uh, social media channels, no one's likely to come after me. But as a company, since you're a commercial venture, you presumably have some money and you should be a little bit more buttoned up than the average human being. Um, this does matter. So one, um, well, a couple of famous examples here, also from the Obama campaign, uh, there was a, a campaign poster that was done and from, well, it wasn't an official campaign poster that was done. It was a, a poster that was done around the time of the campaign based on this photo that was owned by the Associated Press. So the Associated Press took the photo of Obama, they owned the copyright. This artist, Shepard Ferry, painted this, um, what you know has become an iconic uh, poster, but they never got the license from the Associated Press to create this poster and then sell it. And, and Shepard Ferry made quite a lot of money on this poster during the Obama campaign and got sued by the Associated Press. Um, you know, with artists, Sometimes there's a, a fair use argument. We don't have time to go into that, but let's just say as a company, as a commercial company, you're pretty much never gonna be able to use a fair use defense. So just don't even, don't even bring it up. Not an option for you. Um, I think we'll go on. Um, right of publicity, which I'm gonna tie in with copyright a bit because they tend to, to really be related in the area of advertising um, is going to cover the rights of not just celebrities, but celebrities are often the most common um, that that we think of when we talk about right of publicity. I don't, I don't know, I don't think I have time for the video, but this is a commercial that was done with a Kim Kardashian lookalike, and the brand basically couldn't afford Kim Kardashian. And so they got a lookalike to uh, appear in their ad and they were promptly sued by, by Kim's people um, because it was just super obvious that what they're trying to do. And so right of publicity is the right of all of us, even um, us people that are absolutely not famous and nobody really cares, but to control our, um, our likeness, that includes, uh, you know, our, our face, our appearance, our voice, anything that could be, um, you know, especially for people, say, like a famous actor where you know their voice without seeing their face, like anything that's going to be um, a personally identifiable aspect of them. They say, you know, their, their likeness, their name, um, anything that's going to, you're going to be like, oh, well, that's that person. So, you want to be really careful using any celebrities um, in particular, but any person in your social media. Um, one kind of, I like this example because it's really mundane. Like so many of the famous right of publicity cases are like huge uh, stars that some, some company used uh, in a commercial or um, used a photo of them that they didn't, hadn't, authorized something like that but this situation with linkedin is so just like kind of common that i think we 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 see these things and we're getting so used to it in marketing that probably no, not that many people questioned it but basically what happened this is back in um maybe about 10 years ago when you sign up for linkedin 
uh, through that sign up flow, they give you the option at some point to essentially have it go through your the rest of your contacts, right? And it can send invitations to people in your contacts that are not already on LinkedIn. They don't already have LinkedIn profiles. And what it does is it comes as in a way that looks like you're personally inviting them, right? LinkedIn in this situation, they did get consent to send that first uh, email um, that, you know, they did give some level of notification. It wasn't full disclosure though, because what they did is they sent a bunch of follow-up emails. So whoever in your contacts, you know, say 50 of your contacts would get multiple emails and it looks like you were sending them multiple invitations, right? So it has your name. It usually has the, your profile photo that you have on LinkedIn. And it looks like they're, you know, you're inviting them. And so this, this is a right of publicity violation. Like we all have the ability to protect our uh, name, our likeness, any indicia of who we are. And so um, LinkedIn had to send out settlement checks to um, a whole class of people that had subscribed at that time for violating their, their publicity rights. Um, going back to, to copyright, but also, you know, adding in the, the publicity here, um, I'm seeing a lot and I'm picking on this one little company. Um, they sell like coffee that has adaptogenic mushrooms in it. It's not hallucinogenic, but they really like to kind of play that up in their advertising. Um, but I see, I see tons of copyright infringement and right of publicity infringement on Instagram these days in usually smaller companies ads. So these are a few examples. They're using Britney Spears, the Saturday Night Live skit, and even Joe Biden to advertise their, um, their coffee and or their, their mushroom products. And um, presumably they do not have the budget to get any of these people, let alone all of them. Um, so, you know, the risk I would say here, you know, it, it can be in the practical world, like this is blatant infringement in the practical world. Are they going to get caught? I don't know. You know, it depends on whether one of Britney's people sees this and flags it to her, but we very well could get a very nasty letter from um, Britney's attorneys and ask you to take it down or pay uh, some kind of settlement. So it's generally not the kind of headache that you want. These are probably also, um, once again, the actual media, um, the videos that were featured here. And I, I, you know, again, I didn't add the whole video, but the videos themselves were also subject to copyright. So there's two levels of violation here, the copyright holder, as well as the right of publicity. And again, I see this every single day in social media from small companies. So I'm just going to advise you not to do that. It should be licensed if you want to use um, anybody's likeness, whether they're uh, just a starting out actor or they, you know, they just want is trying to get work or whether they're a famous celebrity and you want to make a meme out of them, you need to license it. Even uh, Virgin America, or I think it was Virgin out of Australia actually had grabbed a um, photo of this girl off of one of the maybe Flickr or something like that, one of the photo sites. They thought that they could use it because these photo sites are so commonly used by, by companies to grab their media. They had not uh, paid for it. It was uh, what they thought was basically like an open license for use, but it didn't cover, the license didn't cover um, the right of publicity of the individual. So once they put it on a billboard, then it became problematic. If they had just used, you know, if somebody just used it for personal use, it would have been fine, but um, they were sued. They had to take down billboards all over the country um, and pay the um, pay the girl. Um, I can't remember what the amount was, or maybe it wasn't disclosed, but they had to pay a large settlement for violating her right of publicity. And I know I'm way over, so just going to say on trade secrets. Um, a trade secrets, you know, if you can't get a patent on something, trade secrets secrets are a great way to protect keep something confidential, you know, really protected and, and have that competitive edge. So a lot of famous um, 
you know, things in tech are actually trade secrets. The Google algorithm is a trade secret. The, the, the Facebook, um, you know, newsfeed algorithms have been trade secrets because they're not, they don't qualify for patent protection. Um, McDonald's uh, secret sauce, the KFC recipe, recipes don't qualify for patent protection or any other kind of intellectual property protection. So trade secrets are a great way to continue to protect your, um, that, you know, the uniqueness of your product without actually having to, you know, file anything or get that formal protection. You essentially just have to keep it confidential. And, and there are some parameters around what that looks like. You, you um, don't disclose, you know, if it's a recipe, you don't disclose it to anyone. You don't share it with anyone. You don't leave the recipe on the copy machine laying out. It's um, really kind of on the lockdown. Um, only those employees that need to know have access to it. So I think that's about as quickly as I could go. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to wrap up there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. I don't think I've ever, ever done an event with um, so much information in it. And um, so I'm, I know there's a, and well, minus two minutes left, but I thought it would, would be helpful. If anyone has any outstanding questions, um, brilliant, thank you. Um, in terms of, Emily, have you had your question answered? Can I get my drumstick? Can I get my drumstick from Caroline? No, there's one last one. No, mommy, I have, can I? Oh, yeah, the SNL. So <clears throat> as I said, for, for artistic expression, there is um, some fair use. And while SNL is certainly, there's, you know, the commercial aspect of it, they do parodies, they do a lot of um, what you would consider kind of cultural commentary. And so they're able to get away with some of the, the stuff. Plus they're not, um, there's no uh, replacement, like people aren't, People don't watch SNL and think that that's actually the news, or hopefully nobody watches SNL and thinks that it's actually the news. So they're not actually replacing, you know, when they show their little their news shows or they show the fake president. Nobody, that's not actually replacing anything. So that's how you know SNL does that. Thanks, thanks, Laura. Any other questions? If you just want to unmute yourself and shout out, and um, the relevant person will answer. Anyone? I think the issue is, it's just so informative. There's, there's no remaining questions to ask. Okay. If there's no remaining questions, then I'm just going to say a massive thank you um, to all of our speakers. As the um, as the audience uh, very clear, um, it was hugely hugely helpful.